West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy with Chef Justice Putnam. Netrootsradio.com Je voudrais du soleil vert, des dentelles et des théâtres, des photos de bord de mer, de mon jardin d'hiver. Je voudrais de la lumière, comme en Nouvelle-Angleterre. Je veux changer d'atmosphère, de mon jardin d'hiver. Du frais d'Aster, revoir un latte coer. On November 5th, our nation will hire a president, a commander in chief, and leader of the free world. So let's compare their resumes, shall we? One candidate worked at McDonald's while she was in college at an HBCU. HU. The other was born with a silver spoon in his mouth and helped his daddy in the family business. Housing discrimination, that is. She became a career prosecutor while he became a career criminal. With 34 felonies, two impeachments, and one porn star to prove it. <laughs> Her entire career as an elected district attorney, attorney general, and senator, she's always worked for one client the people. Meanwhile, he's a 78-year-old, lifelong predator, fraudster, and cheat, known for inciting violent mobs. Listen, y'all, he's only looked out for one person, himself. As women are dying, he is bragging about overturning Roe. And y'all know I come from Texas. And right now in Texas, come on Texas. But right now in Texas, they want to institute the death penalty. That is a problem. While Kamala Harris is fighting for our reproductive rights to be restored. She is also the leader we need on the global stage. She helped secure the release of Americans wrongfully detained in Russia. At the same time, he cozies up to his role model, Vladimir Putin, and MAGA holds legislation hostage here at home, critical resources to secure the border, military aid to Ukraine, and even the farm bill. She's lived the American dream while well, he's been America's nightmare. America, looking at the two choices before you, who would you hire? Donald Trump? Or Kamala Harris? Kamala Harris has a resume. Donald Trump has a rap sheet. <laughs> she resides over the Senate while he keeps our national secrets 
next to his thinking chair. Y'all know what I said that other time. In real Lago. <laughs> well, Donald Trump wants to put our 1787 Constitution through his Project 2025 paper shredder and make every day January 6th Kamala Harris is fighting to fulfill the promise of America. In the real world, this wouldn't even be close. But this election is. Don't make a mistake. We are the underdogs in this fight. Even though there is only one person qualified, only one person who's done the work and who has delivered the results. And she needs you. She needs your one vote this November. Can we count on you? Some of you know a little bit of my history. Some of you don't, so let me tell you. I was a public defender. I did criminal defense as well as practice civil rights law for almost two decades. I know a good prosecutor when I see one. Kamala Harris is the kind of prosecutor we long for in the cases like those of Breonna Taylor. Yeah. She was the first attorney general in the nation to order that her officers wear body cams, and she started the Back on Track program to reduce recidivism. Listen, y'all, she did all these things because she genuinely cares about people. She sees each person as just that, a person, not a statistic. She's proven that since the first day she stepped into a courtroom and said what y'all already heard Hillary say, I did not copy off of her speech. I just want y'all to know. <laughs> she walked into that courtroom and said, Kamala Harris, for the people. And she <laughs> Many of you know her credentials. But what I love about Kamala Harris goes beyond her resume. Is that she sees the humanity in everyone. She's the only candidate in this race who is capable of empathy. When I first got to Congress, I wasn't sure I made the right decision. The Chaos Caucus couldn't elect a speaker, and the Oversight Committee was unhinged. I was going through all of this when I visited the Vice President's residence for the first time. As I approached Vice President Harris for our official photo, she turned to me and asked, what's wrong? Mind you, we'd never met, but she saw right through me. She saw the distress. I immediately began crying. And the most powerful woman in the world wiped my tears and listened. It's so hard for me to tell this story. She then said, among other things, you are exactly where God wants you. Your district chose you because they believe in you and so do I. <laughs> the next month, I went viral for the first of many times to come. For hitting Republicans with a dose of their own medicine. That brief but impactful interaction gave me my legislative legs and I've been running ever since. The question before us is, will a 
vindictive, vile villain violate voters' vision? <laughs> For a better America or not, I hear alliterations are back in style. We deserve better. We deserve a president who can be a bright light in a sea of darkness. One who will put us, who will pull us forward because we won't go back. Amanda Gorman said it best. There's always light if only we are brave enough to see it. If only we are brave enough to be it. Kamala Harris showed me that light. And America, when she is our president, together we will shine as that beacon of hope and freedom around the world once more. God bless y'all. It is Wednesday, the 21st of August of 2024, and you are in West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. I am your chef de cuisine, Justice Putnam, Gunner, the English Bulldog, is our snoozing sous chef. Precious, our little Yorkie is the door girl. And though she arose a little bit early this morning, she is now snoozing away and we're going to let her. So with that stated, we will be seating you directly for our especially special daily special, Smothered Benedict Wednesdays. Will no one rid us? of these meddlesome priests. No one. Oh my. Just so you know, there's nothing untoward about a smothered Benedict. It's just a lovely egg dish, fluffy I might add, with a velvety hollandaise sauce. Uh Uh-huh. Okay. Well, second night of the DNC, and I should add that uh, we will be, I pretty sure I spoke with Kelly and uh, I'm pretty sure we're going to live stream tonight's DNC as well. And certainly, certainly we, we will be doing uh, Kamala and uh, Tim's appearance on Thursday. But regardless, uh, I was a little bit slow on the trigger there. I apologize. I had some other commitments. So we uh, broke into the uh, convention a little bit later than we had originally anticipated but regardless tune in please so uh, another grand night in fact it was even more grand by the fact that well the harris campaign filled up a whole other arena in fact it was the arena that just mere weeks ago the rnc held their convention barely filled i might add and uh, nominated nominated their candidate, uh, one Donald J. Trump. I don't remember anybody on our side complaining about some sort of weirdness going on in the RNC, and uh, that that prevented anyone else from being able to be nominated other than Trump. So I, you know, getting discount Goebbels. That's that's who Empty Wheel calls uh that's Stephen Miller that's empty wheel calls uh Stephen Miller discount Goebbels I like to call him Santa Monica Goebbels because that's what his classmates at Santa Monica High called him because it was his mission to get rid of the school's Hispanic janitor because well the guy's an effing racist and he was not afraid to he didn't hide it let's put it that way He was not afraid to go and make public proclamations when he was in high school about the inequities of him having to go to school with a Hispanic janitor in the hallways. What could he be doing? So I could care less what that little effer has to say about the rules of the Democratic National Convention and our party. Which then goes to this weirdness about the corporate media's fact checkers right now. I cannot believe these idiots. Do they think that we're stupid? 
This is rat fucking. This is Roger Stone level rat fucking. How dare they pearl clutch us about dick jokes? Give me an effort break. There's joy in a good dick joke, pal. This morning, they just couldn't get enough of, oh, the, the Obamas, they talk about hope and change, and all they did was out there and called uh, uh, our, our, our leader a rapist. Well, she didn't call him a rapist, but uh, she implied it. She didn't have to, did she? We all know. <laughs> so we need rat fuck checkers on our side to be able to fact check the so-called fact checkers who are rat fucking us right to our faces. And they think that we're going to just roll over and take it. Hell no. Fired up and ready to go. And if that means, I don't know, throttling someone figuratively because they're MAGA weirdos, snap out of it. This is Moonstruck, pal. Slap. I don't know if they'll wake up, but it will set a tone, and the tone is this. We are not going back. We are not going to allow this BS to shade our joy. All right. So I appreciate Michelle coming out last night and essentially saying, look, you know, we started out with the idea that when they go low, we go high. But now, girl, hold my earrings while I <laughs> jump on this mofo's face. And she did. I keep saying we are not hippies that you can kick. We are punks and punks kick back. Not skinheads. Don't mistake us for that. We're out there, well, kicking skinheads. All right. Which I might uh, point out, I was suspended on both. Twitter and Facebook for making violent threats for posting a World War II poster of Uncle Sam rolling up his sleeves with the caption reading, Punch the Nazis. <laughs> so I'm just saying, we got fascists running things, rat fucking us right to our faces right now. And, well, we're not going back. Nope. We are not. And I'm joyful about it. Um, there's a lot that can still be done to, well, throw our election into disarray. We have to be ready on all fronts. But the amount of volunteers, for instance, that joined the Democratic uh, campaign in Florida is through the roof. Only six of the 23 DeSantis-approved uh, uh, school board candidates in the state won. Only six of the 23. And there is an argument to be made that, well, a crazy-ass bastion like Florida that has a DeSantis at his head is truly in play. Texas could be truly in play. Oh, I know they're making some big time efforts to just. <laughs> I love how when they purge their voting rolls, it's only Democratic Party members that get purged. Interesting, isn't it? And then in the midst of all this, how is it that whenever somebody like Donald Trump violates any kind of norm, law, or act, Nothing happens. I mean, the guy is negotiating with Netanyahu out in the open saying don't accept a ceasefire because it'll uh, be bad for uh, uh, the Harris campaign. It was bad for Joe and it's going to be bad for Kamala and that's what we want. And, uh, and Netanyahu says, damn right. So. 
So that's a Logan Act violation. And I know there has never been an actual investigation and conviction under the Logan Act, but it is still there. And if they can pull out some sort of weird wacko law from before a state was even a state to prevent a woman from being able to have reproductive health care, then why don't we go ahead and pull out laws that are already on the books and have been uh, and were put there for a reason? And this is the reason. Well, I guess the answer to that is that we have been saturated with heritage society and or heritage foundation and federalist society i'm just gonna say it maga nazis i know that they were around before the maga nazi but that's only because they couldn't name themselves until now and well we we, they didn't necessarily name themselves but i'm just saying Heritage Foundation and Federalist Society had taken the Soviet 70-year plan, adopted it, and put it into motion. Took them 50 years. And they think that they have shrunk our democracy down to the size where they can drown it in a bathtub. And no, it has not. You have no idea how big democracy is. And if you try it, Well, do you feel lucky, punk? Okay, now that I've got that off my chest, let us give you a little rundown on what's happening with our precious today. She goes in for her weekly IV drip. Uh, She still seems spunky. Came up on the bed last night. I was not even aware. I'm a light sleeper, and I had no idea she was up on the bed when I got up this morning. And she got down off the bed after about an hour of me being up and uh, found her way up onto the uh, sofa in the front room where she is now snoozing away. Good girl. (laughs) Unfortunately, my English bulldog, our English bulldog, our snoozy sous chef, he decided to get up from his snoozing. And the last... Well, more than several mornings, he has taken to barking to get me to go out there and give him his food. And I'm going to tell you, there are some things I let them train me to do. And there's others I have to set my foot down and say, look, (laughs) we are friends, but you're on my timeline. So there, not always, but certain things. So I have to, like, train him not to bark, and then I get up in the Pavlovian state, with tongue salivating, by the way, and give him his food, because that's what uh, Pavlovian does to you. All right, what do we have in store for you as we begin this fabulous Smothered Benedict Wednesdays in the Bistro Cafe of West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy? Well, I love that Jasmine Crockett, I think that was her... Now, we've known about her for a considerable time, but I think in terms of, like, quote, breakout speeches, that was her breakout speech, even more so than AOC's, though I really liked AOC's, too. But uh, Jasmine Crockett uh, put it down when she explained that, well, Kamala Harris has a resume and Donald Trump has a rap sheet. (laughs) I love that. MAGA is going to be totally anti-law and order if there's any black people involved. Hispanic and Asians, too. Let's just be clear. They hated what they saw last night during the roll call because that roll call was like the panning shot in Independence Day when the big spaceships start, well, positioning themselves over all the uh, major population centers around the globe. And they showed the multicultural, multi-ethnic population of New York. I love that scene. That's a Rockwell painting. And uh, MAGA hates that. The only thing they hate more than America are Americans because Americans look like us. And I'm just saying that because I'm a white guy, almost 70 years old, so I can get away with it. But I've got some other uh, ethnicities. uh, Well, 
pretty close by, like right inside my DNA. Isn't that weird? As if that has anything to do with it. Okay. <laughs> Back to what we have in store for you. Oh, yes. On the rest of the menu, over 13,000 complaints of tenant harassment in Los Angeles has led to only four fines in the last three years and no criminal indictments. Curious, isn't it? A Trump-appointed federal judge struck down the FTC rule banning non-compete agreements. And the reason for it, because I'll just cut to the chase, is that it uh, affects something like 300, or some, some ungodly number of workers who had to sign non-compete agreements against their will. And since they signed a contract, a contract is a contract to a MAGA judge. And the American Civil Liberties Union of Oregon is suing the city of Medford, saying its police department has been unlawfully monitoring progressive political activists who are not suspected of criminal activity. You know, a clear violation of their constitutional rights. Overreach by a police state. Yes. After the break, we move to the chef's table where Russia's top court has refused to release Navalny's lawyers pending their trial on extremism charges. Do we want that coming to an America near us? No, we are not going back. And... Taiwan has been conducting live-fire missile drills as China ramps up its military threats. What could go wrong? All that and more on West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. Bon Appetit. As usual, going to forego the usuals and tuck right into this first offering here in the Bistro Cafe of West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. But I should remind folks that uh, do follow me on social media, because at Justice Putnam, by the way, because then you will have quick access to the show notes and links diary on Daily Coast in which you will be able to read the actual full articles by the actual reporters. So do that, at Justice Putnam. All right, this first offering here in the Bistro Cafe of West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy is out of the Los Angeles Times by Paloma Esquivel. In the three years since Los Angeles banned landlords from harassing tenants and made violating the rules a criminal offense, more than 13,000 complaints alleging harassment have been filed with the Housing Department. About two dozen of those cases were referred to the department by the department to the city attorney's office. And so far, four fines are pending and no cases have been criminally prosecuted. When it was approved in 2021, Los Angeles's tenant anti-harassment ordinance was touted as a breakthrough for renters' rights. At a time of rapidly rising housing costs, the rules were meant to protect tenants from being threatened or intimidated by landlords. A tactic advocates say is sometimes used to push people out of rent-controlled homes. You know, like turning off the water, the power, dumping garbage at their front door, 
I'm serious. These are all tactics used to get tenants out so they can move somebody in and jack up the rent-controlled rent. But tenant advocates say harassment has continued largely unchecked in the three years since the law passed, with tenants regularly reporting that their landlords resort to intimidation, illegal eviction notices, threats, lockouts, and other Actions meant to make their living situations difficult to bear. The thousands of complaints and lack of prosecution since 2021 are further evidence that the law is weak and needs to be strengthened, advocates say. Now, landlord advocates, of course, say the lack of prosecution shows that tenant harassment is not a problem and that the advocates say it is and are urging the city to reject the changes. The ordinance was adopted amid the pandemic when the city's eviction moratorium was in place. Tenants said landlords were increasingly turning to harassment to get them to leave without having to go to court to seek an eviction. But as soon as the law was approved, some advocates said they worried it had been watered down too much to be effective. A 2022 Housing Department report noted that when the ordinance was initially adopted, resources were not provided to that department or to the city attorney for its implementation. Some funding was eventually approved, and the Housing Department created a Tenant Anti-Harassment Ordinance Task Force, which was charged with focusing on problem properties and landlords, and monitoring for compliance. The report also noted that there had been challenges proving that landlords were acting in bad faith, as the law requires. Sharon Sandow, a spokeswoman for the Housing Department, said that when harassment allegations are substantiated, a housing investigator will call the landlord to address the allegation and then send them information about the ordinance. If the matter is egregious or persists, the case is referred to the Anti-Harassment Ordinance Task Force for further review and analysis to determine the possibility of a pattern of behavior and assess the enforcement mechanism. Wow, that's a lot of jargon. In the vast majority of cases, she added, tenants withdraw or abandon the complaint fail to provide evidence to substantiate the case, or the matter is resolved by the department. Really? But Sergio Vargas, co-director of the L.A. chapter of the Alliance of Californians for Community Empowerment, or ACC, ACE, said the city has not done enough to follow up and fully investigate complaints. We know there are more cases out there that should be taken into account. Mark at the Washington Post brings us this next offering here in the Bistro Cafe of West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. A federal judge in Texas yesterday, Tuesday, struck down the Federal Trade Commission's ban on non-compete agreements, finding that the agency exceeded its authority with a rule that would have voided contracts that bar workers from moving to rival employers. Uh... In a 27-page opinion, U.S. District Judge Ada Brown found that the FTC lacked the statutory authority to issue the rule, which would have taken effect on September 4th. In reaching her decision, Brown wrote that the FTC's promulgation of the rule is an unlawful agency action. Ah, 
An estimated 30 million workers in a wide range of fields are subject to non-compete agreements. The FTC in April voted 3-2 to two to issue the rule with commissioners in the majority pointing to evidence that the agreements suppress wages, stifle entrepreneurship, and gum up labor markets. If it had gone into effect, the rule would have made it illegal for employers to include the agreements in employment contracts and would have invalidated existing clauses for most workers subject to them. And now we're not talking about you know, some engineer from a tech company taking company secrets possibly to another company. We're talking about janitors not being able to go from one building to another. Please. We're disappointed by Judge Brown's decision and we'll keep fighting to stop non-competes that restrict the economic liberty of hardworking Americans, hamper economic growth, limit innovation, and depress wages, FTC spokeswoman Victoria Graham said in an email. We are seriously considering a potential appeal and today's decision does not prevent the FTC from addressing non-competes through case-by-case enforcement actions. Brown, who was appointed by Trump, hinted, hinted at her thinking last month when she temporarily blocked the non-compete rule. Brown wrote in her opinion yesterday, Tuesday, that in addition to exceeding its authority, the FTC issued the rule based on inconsistent and flawed empirical evidence. Okay, while failing to consider evidence supporting non-compete clauses, she also wrote that the agency failed to find alternatives to the rule it issued. The role of an administrative agency is to do as told by Congress, not to do what the agency thinks it should do, Brown wrote. In other words, experts don't have an opinion. Experts don't have facts. Only we, the judiciary, and those appointed by the great orange god are able to rule. Now, Brown's opinion stands in contrast to a Pennsylvania judge's ruling last month that rejected a similar challenge. In denying a Pennsylvania-based tree care company's bid for a preliminary injunction against the FTC rule, U.S. District Judge Kelly Bribson Hodge, or Brisbane Hodge, oh, yeah, Hodge, who was appointed by President Joe Biden, found that the FTC agency was well within its authority to issue it. In a third case, a federal judge in Florida last week blocked the FTC rule, but only for the plaintiffs in that specific instance. Press staff brings us this final offering here in the Bistro Cafe part of West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. The American Civil Liberties Union of Oregon is suing the city of Medford, saying its police department has been unlawfully monitoring progressive political activists who are not suspected of criminal activity. City officials insisted they have not monitored the groups because of their views or constitutionally protected activities, but only to prepare for possible public safety impacts such as traffic disruptions, 
conflicts between protesters and counter-protesters and property damage. I must add, the only instances of this ever occurring is when Proud Boy right-wing MAGA Nazis come and try to, well, disrupt library libraries from having story reading hour with or without drag queens. In the early 80s, after revelations that police Portland police had routinely surveilled civil liberties, racial justice, and or other groups, the Oregon legislature approved a law barring law enforcement agencies from collecting information about the political, religious, or social views or activities of any individual or group unless it directly relates to a criminal investigation. According to the lawsuit filed Yesterday, Tuesday, in Jackson County Circuit Court, the Medford Police Department, for several years, has monitored the activities of social media accounts of people involved in a, an array of causes, including racial justice, LGBTQ+, and reproductive rights, preventing drug overdoses, and providing services for unhoused people. The lawsuit is based on police emails and other documents first obtained through public records requests. It alleges that the police department broke the law by monitoring or infiltrating social media accounts or groups for information about protests, including Black Lives Matter and bans off our bodies. The demonstration around the Supreme Court's decision overturning the federal right to abortion in 2022. Well, we have our Oath Keeper sheriffs and we have our 3% sheriffs. Maybe it's time we did a little bit of internal investigations. Well, that brings us to our break. And when we get back from that break, we will go through weather from around the world. And we will finish up with the stories that we have curated for you today. You are listening to West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. And we will be right back. You are listening to NetworksRadio.com. Please hang up and try again. From a point at sea to the circles of your mind, a new force is at work for planetary transformation. New radio for a new earth. This is Take Two Movie Review. I'm Kim Lowe. This week, a different kind of parent trap. M. Night Shyamalan is so known for his signature plot twist that he's practically an adjective. However, the surprise in his latest offering, Trap, doesn't revolve around such a twist, but instead on something far more unexpected. Empathy for a cold-blooded serial killer. It's not a surprise that the lead character, Cooper, played by Josh Hartnett, in a career-defining role, is the butcher. When he's not ruthlessly kidnapping and murdering, Cooper is a caring family man, here fulfilling his teenage daughter's dream by taking her to see her pop idol, Lady Raven, in concert. However, Cooper soon learns that the concert is really a sting opera to catch him, so he has to figure out an escape before the cops can close in. It's not an easy task, but one gets the impression that Cooper couldn't have been as successful at his secret avocation if he weren't damn smart. The film becomes a game of cat and mouse with Cooper's nemesis turning out to be an FBI profiler, played by the legendary former child star Haley Mills, who always anticipates his next move. While Trapped is ostensibly about a killer, it's also a meditation on family and the secrets that all families have. Casting Mills, the original star of the Disney classic The Parent Trap, is cute, if not brilliant. Also keeping with the family theme, Shyamalan casts his daughter, Salika, as Lady Raven. While it's tempting to write her off as a Nepo baby, Salika shows real talent both as a singer and an actress, though more for the former. That, along with her photogenic features, makes her a captivating performer with a potential career. Overall, Trapped is one of Shyamalan's better offerings of late. While there are some credulity-straining moments, it'll keep you engaged. This has been Take Two Movie Review. I'm Kim Lowe. Catch up with us at TakeTwoMovieReview.com and feed us back on our channel on YouTube.
Hi, I'm Tom Harbin, and since you're listening to NetrootsRadio.com, show your progressive side and go to the Donate button on the bottom of the homepage. It's progressives like you who power Netroots Radio and keep the progressive message beaming everywhere 24 hours a day. Just go to our Donate button at the bottom of NetrootsRadio.com. Thank you for keeping progressive radio at full power. Do you have the right to flip off a cop? I'm Bill Newman, and this is the Civil Liberties Minute. In 2018, Vermont resident Greg Bombard was stopped by a Vermont State Police Sergeant, Jay Regan, who thought, mistakenly it turned out, that Bombard had flipped him off while the two were driving in opposite directions on Main Street in the town of St. Albans. The trooper then interrogated the motorist aggressively. After that, the aggrieved motorist, while driving away, in fact did give Regan the middle finger and for good measure added, hole and you. In response, the cop pulled him over a second time and this time arrested him and charged him with disorderly conduct, a charge that ultimately was dismissed. Later, on a Christmas Day, some people who had read about this story called the police and shared their feelings. A dispatcher claimed erroneously that one caller was the motorist Bombard, who was again issued another criminal citation for again disorderly conduct, this time by telephone. A charge also thrown out because he hadn't called the cops at all. The story ends in the summer of 2024, when Vermont, for its unconstitutional actions and the grief it caused, paid Bombard $175,000 in a settlement. Because the First Amendment does protect impassioned, impolite communication with the cops. Although, as a practical matter, the police have the power to arrest, even when they don't have that right. The Civil Liberties Minute is made possible by the ACLU, because freedom can't protect itself. You're listening to the American Democracy Minute, keeping your government by and for the people. You may have heard references to the Purcell Principle in news reports. What started out as a U.S. Supreme Court opinion to minimize confusion and disruption close to an election may now be a partisan voter suppression tactic. Five weeks before the 2006 midterms, a federal court stayed an Arizona voter ID proof of citizenship law intended to suppress Native American voters. The Supreme Court took the case on an emergency basis, the so-called shadow docket, and overturned Purcell v. Gonzalez, citing confusion for voters and election workers if changes were implemented too close to the election. Courts have since cited Purcell to delay voting rights and redistricting cases, sometimes at the expense of the right to vote or fair districts, as with the racially gerrymandered maps in Alabama's Milligan case. A lower court struck down the maps in January 2022, but the U.S. Supreme Court stayed the order, allowing their use for the midterms, only to throw them out in June 2023 as a violation of the Voting Rights Act. It undoubtedly cost black Alabamians fair representation. A similar scenario may be unfolding in Louisiana, where fair congressional maps were struck down with the 2024 election just six months away. Could a partisan court influence an election just by manipulating a voting rights case on its calendar, then citing Purcell? We'll be watching. Find more at AmericanDemocracyMinute.org. I'm Brian Beal. I'm Rick Smith, and this is Labor History in Two. On this day in labor history, the year was 1831. That was the year Nate Turner led a slave rebellion in Southampton, Virginia. From a young age, Turner believed he had a purpose ordained by God. Turner had learned to read from one of his master's sons. He had also learned a deep hatred of slavery from his mother. He came to be regarded as a spiritual leader or a prophet by many of the nearby enslaved people. In February of 1831, there was a solar eclipse. Turner took it as a sign that it was time to lead a revolt. He began to make plans. Then, along with seven other enslaved people, he killed the entire family that owned his plantation. The group made their way from plantation to plantation, killing 51 whites in all. Their plan was to raid the town of Jerusalem. But before they could reach the town, they were met by a militia of 3,000. The small band of between 60 and 75 insurrectionists were no match for the militia. More than 50 slaves were executed. Many more were beaten. Some were from as far away as neighboring North North Carolina and had nothing to do with the uprising. White hysteria swept the South. More repressive slave codes were passed in many states. 
harsher restrictions were enacted against enslaved people for preaching, being educated, and assembling in large groups. That year, Virginia, Maryland, and Florida all passed laws restricting even freed black men from carrying a gun. Nate Turner escaped the militia into the dismal swamp. He stayed there for six weeks before he was discovered. He was tried, convicted, and hung. Many historians credit Turner's rebellion and the harsh repression that followed in hastening the coming Civil War and the end of the slave labor system. Labor History in Two brought to you by the Illinois Labor History Society and the Rick Smith Show. For more information, go to laborhistoryin2.com. Thank you for accompanying us here to the chef's table at West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy Smothered Benedict Wednesdays. We always begin, whether from around the world along the banks of the Rogue River, in the Rogue River Valley of Southern Oregon on the west coast of the continental United States of America, where it is currently 56 degrees Fahrenheit, expecting highs around 86 to 87, abundant sunshine with winds out of the west-northwest at a brisk 10 to 15 miles per hour, and then partly cloudy early uh, this evening, followed by cloudy skies overnight, lows in the mid to upper 50s, winds out of the west-northwest, decreasing to 5 to 10 miles per hour, and then a mix of clouds and sun in the morning tomorrow, Thursday, followed by cloudy skies during the afternoon, and rain expected later on at night, with highs tomorrow plummeting to 73 degrees Fahrenheit, winds out of the west-northwest at 5 to 10 miles per hour. 73 in the San Francisco Bay Area is a heat wave. It's kind of chilly here. Anyway, grass pollen is rated low here in Rogue River proper. The air quality index for the region is in the good range at 17 parts per million. That's nice. And the daytime UV index remains high at level 7. Continue to take care. Barometric pressure is falling at 30.12 inches. Visibility is up to 10 miles and relative humidity is at 81%. Weather from around the world is brought to you by a crowd of crowdsourced weather stations that a crowd crowdsources from around the world, and that is the weather underground. London is 70 degrees and mostly cloudy. Paris is 73 and sunny. Rome is 91 and sunny. Kabul is 70 degrees and clear. Hong Kong is 87 and fair. Tokyo is 81 degrees and cloudy. Auckland, New Zealand is 48 and fair. San Francisco, California is 60 degrees and mostly cloudy. Chicago, Illinois is 70 degrees and partly cloudy. And New York, New York is 70 degrees Fahrenheit and sunny. And that is weather from around the world Brought to you by a crowd of crowdsourced weather stations that a crowd crowdsources from around the world. desk of the Associated Press brings us this first amuse-bouche here at the chef's table at West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy, smothered Benedict Wednesdays. Russia's Supreme Court yesterday, Tuesday, refused to release three lawyers who once represented Russia's slain opposition leader Alexei Navalny 
and are now facing charges of extremism. It also refused to transfer their case to a different court, even as the defense alleged a conflict of interest. Vadim Kobazes, Igor Zaragunin, and Alexei Lipster were arrested in October in a case widely seen at the time as a means to ramp up pressure on the Kremlin's fiercest, fiercest foe. According to Navalny's allies, authorities accused the lawyers of using their status as defense attorneys to pass letters from the imprisoned politician to his team, thus serving as intermediaries between Navalny and what they called his extremist group. Navalny's organizations in Russia, the Foundation for Fighting Corruption, and a vast network of regional offices were outlawed and labeled as extremist groups in 2021, a step that exposed anyone involved with them to prosecution. Lawyers for the three attorneys had petitioned the Supreme Court to transfer their case away from a court in Russia's western Vladimir region, claiming it may not be objective or impartial, do you think? The defense argued the bulk of the prosecution's evidence was gathered in a law enforcement raid they consider illegal and that had been ordered by a superior court in the same region, something they said constituted a conflict of interest. It also charged that courts in Vladimir had pressured Navalny's lawyers to disclose confidential communications with him before the politician's February death in a remote Arctic prison. Even more hard-working staff at the World Desk of the Associated Press brings us this final amuse-bouche here at the chef's table at West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. Taiwan's military launched surface-to-air missiles and live-fire drills conducted yesterday, Tuesday, in response to growing military pressure from China. The exercises took place at the Zhui Peng military base in a remote area in southern Taiwan. Among the missiles launched were Taiwan's domestically made Skybo-3 anti-ballistic missiles, along with U.S.-made Patriot Pac-2 and surface-to-air standard missiles. China claims the democratically ruled island of Taiwan as its own territory to be brought under its control by force if necessary and ramped up its military threat in recent years. Beijing in particular, dislikes Taiwan's new president, Le Jingte, who took office earlier this year and whom Beijing has called a separatist. Taipei has boosted its deterrence capabilities in response. Missiles both domestically built and U.S. made are key to its defense strategy. Beijing did not immediately react to Taiwan's drill. China sends military jets and vessels near Taiwan frequently in what critics call an intimidation tactic, indeed. Well, that brings us to the end of our broadcast period for the day. But you do know, Netroots Radio broadcasts on, and we will meet up here tomorrow for Metro Shrimp and Grits Thursdays. So do stay tuned to Netroots Radio all day and all night for all the breaking news as it breaks. And we will meet up here tomorrow, right here in West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. Bon appétit.
Je voudrais du soleil vert Des dentelles et des TL Des photos de bord de mer D'un manche à d'un hiver Je voudrais de la lumière Comme en Nouvelle-Angleterre Je veux changer d'atmosphère D'un manche à d'un hiver Je voudrais du frais d'Astère Revoir un latécoère Je voudrais toujours te plaire Dans mon jardin d'hiver Je veux déjeuner par terre Comme au long de golfe clair T'embrasser les yeux ouverts Dans mon jardin d'hiver Dans mon jardin d'hiver Dans mon jardin d'hiver 